Okay. <laughs> Ludovic is going to tell us about geeks, which is uh, for geeks or for people too. For geeks. <laughs> okay. So here we go. So hello. Uh, my name is Ludovic, and uh, so I'm the co-maintainer of Guile, together with Andy Ringo, which you've probably met, most of you, I guess. And so Guile is a scheme implementation, and it's great. And I, I'm also a contributor to NixOS. So how many of you know have heard about NixOS? That's quite a lot. So, so basically. The idea of this talk is to get these two popular projects and to marry them somehow. <laughs> okay, so what's Geeks? So Geeks is a new thing, it's pronounced Geeks like Guile and not Guile and Grix. Okay, that's very important. And it's a functional package manager. And it's written in Scheme with Guile and it's a new programming layer for Nix. So, what's Nix? So Nix is a functional package manager. So you may say functional, what do you mean by functional? Okay, so yeah, of course, other package managers like APT, DPKJ work too, so that's, that's not what I mean by functional, but I'm going to get back to this later. And um, yeah, so NixOS, so, but most of you already know it, so it's a free GNU Linux distribution which was started around 2006 or a bit earlier. So it, initially it was more of a research project and an experiment, but now it's a community project with a whole lot of contributors and many packages and nice features. So I'm going to basically present what Nix and NixOS offer because Gix is more or less using the same ideas. So here we go. So basically Nix provides many features which are not commonly available. So from the user point of view, suppose you want to install two packages in a row, like you want to install GC 4.5 and IceCat, so you can do it as a normal user, you don't need sudo or you don't need to be root. And you can have one user which installs, say, GC 4.5, and another user on the same machine which installs a different version, and it just works. So you may say many machines are single users nowadays, but okay. And now if you look at the dependencies of what, what this person installed, you see it's using such version of glibc, such version of gtk+, blah, blah, blah. Whereas this user on the same machine has different, a different version of glibc, a different version of gtk+, and so on, and it just works. And so I mentioned transparent binary source deployment. So what happens basically if, so if you're lucky when you want to install something, it will just say this path, these packages are going to be downloaded and it just downloads them and packs them and you're done. But sometimes, for instance, if you've modified the packages or if for some reason there is no pre-built binary available, then you may end up with something like this saying, okay, these ones, these dependencies are available as pre-built binaries, so they will be downloaded, whereas these ones need to be built. Okay, so it's, it transparently uses either pre-built binaries available on, on a remote site, for instance, or it uses, it actually builds the software, so it's transparent. Okay, transactional upgrades and rollback. So that's another nice feature. So basically, if you want to upgrade your, your user environment, so all the packages which are visible to you, so with Nix, you can use this command, nix -env dash dash upgrade star to upgrade everything. And so it will upgrade all the packages that you, you have. And if everything goes well, then you can, you can it's, well, it's a transaction, so everything is upgraded and you can just notice that you, you actually get the new versions that you wanted. But if something goes wrong, like you, you unplug your computer right, right in the middle of the upgrade, well, that's no problem. It still works, so you, you have the previous versions available and it's not broken. So try to do this with a regular distro, and basically the system is likely to be screwed. So that, that's the idea. Um, so you can do rollback too. So suppose you, you upgrade GIMP because you want the latest and greatest. So you have version 2.6.8, which is no longer the latest. And you're happy, oh, you upgrade it to the new version, and the new version basically doesn't work. So you're, you're not so happy. 
Okay, so you could go ahead and, and debug GIMP. That's uh, one solution. The other one is just to roll back and you just get back to the previous generation instantly and you get back to your previous scheme version, which actually works. So that, that's pretty cool. Okay, so what NixOS provides to is whole system descriptions and instantiations. We couldn't read the previous slide. <laughs> oh yeah, so why? Right. It's, yeah, so that's, that's just the outline, so yes. Can you uh, tab known uh, configurations and then roll back later? So I've observed when I use Debian sometimes that I need to install a package from testing. Yeah. And it pulls in a bunch of dependencies and then a month later I realize that some other program has broken. And then trying to figure out how to roll everything back to get to the state where it actually works. It also works is very difficult and time consuming. Yeah, so actually Nix numbers each each well each generation of your environment. Uh, you cannot currently add a tag to say this number is called Versions that works. Does it just tell me <laughs> but when the versions were created or the generation was created? So the timestamp was associated? Yeah, there's a timestamp, yeah. So it, that's, that gives a hint, typically. And if I roll back, can I easily roll forward again? <coughs> Sorry? If I roll back, can I easily roll forward? So say yeah. I roll back, then can I say roll forward to version, to generation uh, 287 later? Yeah, you can switch between any generation number, so that's. That's the idea. Is it able to manage? What happens with configuration files? So, okay, so... When you, or directory, configuration directories where you can add new files, for example. So you mean, you mean per user configuration files like yeah, dot gimp? For example, when you use dot gimp, but then you use from a full scripts for the new version. Script full stuff. I mean, yeah. oh. Yeah, so it doesn't handle it. So the short answer is if you have per user configuration file like a .gimp RC, whatever, it doesn't handle it. So it's still your job to actually manage your configuration file and upgrade it. Or so yeah, that's, that can be annoying, but yeah, Nix doesn't handle it. The configuration of the server. Uh, for example, you create the LDAP server and you roll back. Uh, it's rolling back to your old configuration or do you must have no, no, no. So per user configuration files, uh, Nix doesn't touch it, so it's your job, yeah. Okay, so now the cool thing is that in, with NixOS you get a, a single configuration file which is global and describes basically all the system configurations. So you have things like um, you say which kernel, which version of the kernel you want to use, which modules, for instance, how you want to build your initRD, what parameters you want to provide for grub, and which file systems are mounted, what swap you used, networking settings, CTUID programs, blah, 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 users. So everything is, you can put it in, in a single file and describe the whole system configuration. So the cool thing with this, yeah, you can also describe services like if you want to start an SSH daemon, if you want to start every heat or blah blah blah, you can all describe it here. And the cool thing is once you've, you have this description, you can actually do the same thing as with user environments. So you can, um, you can do transactional upgrades to a new system configuration and you can do rollback and everything. So if you do an XOS rebuild switch, well it will switch to the new version to with a new configuration, right? And if you do build VM, what does it do? It actually creates um, a QMU image which you can run to test your machine before actually switching to the new generation. So you get a script which you can run to, to try your new configuration and if you start it, you, well you get a VM where you can just make sure that things actually work. At least in the VM. And then if you're, if you're satisfied with what you got in the VM, you can try test and it will activate the configuration right now. So if you have like new services enabled or new versions, it will start them. And finally, when you're really happy and you want it to, to be the default at boot time, then you can say switch and it will add an entry to the grab menu. So next time you boot, you have an additional entry in the grab menu saying this is the new generation, configuration 37. And that's it. So if it turns out to not work as expected, you can still boot in a previous configuration. 
So that's the idea. And of course, you can use nix switch dash dash rollback if, if there's any problem. And voila. So you're already convinced, I guess, and you want to know more. So maybe we, it's time for a break. So if you have any question or doubts or anything. Yeah. yeah. The packages that you install are is the pristine the source packages or have they been uh, tuned in a particular way? Uh, that is, uh, is 5% of the package uh, already configured for something? Or is it pristine clean? So, so it's mostly a problem of the distribution itself, right? Not, not, it's not directly connected to to how Nix and NixOS work. But basically, most of the time, it's pristine packages, yeah. So, yeah, I'll I tell more about it later, but usually it's pristine. But, but if, if I wanted to have my SuperDuper package, distributed with Nix. I, I don't have to modify it at all. I can just take the tarball and... Yeah, right, yeah. So, I mean, adding a package to the Nix distribution, which is actually called Nix PKG. So Nix, Nix PKG is a subset of Nix OS, so to speak. So it's a collection of packages. And if you, if you want to add your package to this distribution, it's just like adding a package in Debian or anything else, right? Yeah, but so with Debian, it has to be... Um, it has to be a lot of... Uh, well... A lot, but there has to be. There is a particular effort that has to be required to. Um, yeah. So you you need to provide a build recipe and stuff like that. I'm I'm going to describe it afterwards. Yeah. Okay. All right. Does so so how does the system deal with, uh, uh, I guess, conflicting requirements on system-wide services like if I have Apache or SSH? Yeah. I have two users run an SSH service on port 22. Um, oh. I have version dependencies on my Apache that I'm running for my PHP script, which I might even use on work, but it has this impact on this Apache on port 80. How do yeah. you use that? So for, for whole system services, which basically all the services which are started when you boot your computer and which needs pr special privileges, special ports, and etc. So you can, you can basically do all the checks that you need at, at rebuild time. So when you type NixOS rebuild, there are several checks that can be made statically before you actually build the new configuration. I'm so not necessarily talking about something that has a privilege. It's a privilege. Like if I run a MySQL server, right? Yes. I can have somebody wants MySQL 5.5 and somebody else wants 5.1. Uh, you mean as a user or as a system-wide service? Oh, or I can run Postgres or MySQL as a normal user. I don't need yeah. special privileges. So if it's as a normal... Two users have different version requirements there. Yeah, well, well, it works. You want to know how it works? I'm going to, to detail it. That's what you're asking. Okay, I'm going to, to go into the details. Um, yeah? Okay, so I, I just continue. So now, now I'll tell a bit more about how it actually works because I was just you know, showing off with all the features and now let's see how it works. So build environments. So, okay, so Nix started uh, based on the idea that it's actually very hard to have reproducible build environments. So, what defines a build environment? So, there are several things, like when you're building some package, what matters is which versions of the dependencies are being used, which compiler is being used, what compilation options you used, and there are several other things which could matter, like what local you're using, what time zone you're in. Sometimes it can interfere with the build process in some weird way. And even which paths are being used, like is your compiler under user being GCC or user being GCC-4.5. So, and then, then there are a number of options. So you have to give dash i flags, dash l flags to the compiler and linkers. There are environment variables all around, many of them. And all this can interfere in weird ways. So it's actually very hard to control all of this. And it can lead to, to build environments which are hard to reproduce. Like you have some user saying, oh, I can build your software on my machine. And you say, well, that's weird. We have the same versions and everything, and it works for me. But yeah, there are so many things to check if you want to make sure the environment is really the same, that yeah, it's, it's actually pretty hard. So Nix try to, tries to address this. So it has several tricks to, to really control the build environment. So first, 
Each package is installed in its old directory, so think of it like GNU store, for instance, is more or less the same idea, but in a more formal way. And then, once a package is, in, is installed, it's immutable, so you're never going to modify any package which is, once it's installed, right? And if you have, you, you cannot have a build process with undeclared dependencies, like if you have some package which needs Perl, it really needs to have a configure script, for instance, which actually checks that Perl is available, something like that. Because if you don't explicitly specify this build process needs Perl, then it won't have it. That's, that's the idea. So that's the principle of list authority. Um, so to achieve this, the build itself is performed in a, in a CH route, typically, where only the actual declared dependencies are available. So if you said, this build process needs GCC, GNOMAKE, BASH, CORE UTILS, and that's it, then it will only have it in the CH route. So it cannot use Perl if you didn't explicitly say, I need Perl in this build process. And on GNU Linux, it also uses separate UIDs and PID namespaces with this Linux feature. So that's the idea. So, so there's a special directory called slash nix slash store. So we call it the, the nix store typically. And in that directory, you have one directory for each package that you built. So you have, say, one directory for libc, lsh, gnu tls, emacs, and all their subdirectories in there. So that's the idea. And you have a weird hash there, which basically identifies all the inputs to the build process. So each time you switch, you flip a bit in some of the inputs of the build process, you basically get a different hash. So if you, if you build two different variants of libc, for instance, you will get two different hashes. So two different variants could mean that you're using a different compiler, or you're, you're setting different environment variables, or, I don't know, doing, changing something in the build script, whatever. Um, yes? Do you virtualize time? No. So that's the that's problem, because I think at some point, GNU LD would add a timestamp by default to builds, so you would get non-deterministic build results. But I think it's now switched off by default, something like that. But still, you, if, if your build process uses time in a weird way, of course, you can get weird stuff. Yeah. Um, so now, since you have all these all these packages in different directories, you need a way to actually get the union of all these things. So the way it's done is using symlinks. So f from the user point of view, what you have is just a, f a symlink forest, which points to all these packages. So suppose you have version 42, which points to, to an environment containing OpenSSH search version and search version of IceCat. Then you want to upgrade OpenSSH, so first of all, a new environment is created with symlinks pointing to the new version of OpenSSH, right? And yeah, so that, that's the actual environment with pointers to the SSH and ISCAT binaries. And once this is done, uh, atomically you get a new, a new generation of your user environment pointing to this new uh, symlink forest. Okay, so atomically you get, uh, well, the new set of packages. Um, that's it. And you can, uh, yes? What's the prefix that you build with? So when you build a package, you use dash dash prefix equals whatever? Yeah, so dash dash, dash prefix equals to slash nix slash store slash this hash. Mm -hmm. so what is that hash generated over? So, so the binaries, because you don't know what the binaries are before you. So roughly the hash is generated over all the inputs to the build process. So, dependencies, build scripts, variables, stuff. Um, okay, and of course you can remove previous generations if you no longer need them. And eventually you can even run the garbage collector, and if, if some paths are no longer referenced from anywhere in the system, then they get removed. So that's just like regular garbage collector thing, but applied to the file system. Okay, so store path. So suppose you want to, to execute the build process to actually build the guide package, the guide binary. So you would type this command, and you would get this path with this hash 
which, as I said before, is basically the hash of all the dependencies and build scripts and stuff. Um, so you can query all the prerequisites of a given path, so all the dependencies, and, and the system knows that this, this particular binary depends on all this path. So libc, libun string, blah, blah, blah. And since the system has all the information about the dependencies, you can even copy the whole closure, so the, the package itself and all its dependencies to a different machine, and, we, and it will just copy all the, all the paths which are actually needed on the remote side. So that's pretty convenient. And so we end up with a, a complete dependency specification. So if you look at, uh, we, we can see much, so this is actually, a, imagine a, a dense DAG, <laughs> okay? So this is GNU hello, so GNU hello is actually at the bottom of the DAG, right? And this is all the dependencies needed to actually build it. So you would think that GNU hello has few dependencies, but actually when you think about it, it needs GCC, GLIPC, make, which itself needs another GCC, libc, etc. So with Nix, you get a complete specification of the dependencies uh, down to the compiler's compiler itself. Okay, so for instance, you're using some GCC, but it itself had to be compiled from another compiler, right? So in Nix, you're obliged to provide all the specification. You cannot just get you know, some compiler out of the blue. So in the end, it boils down. So for bootstrapping purposes, there are a very, there's a very small set of pre-built binaries at the very beginning, which is then used to build, you know, the first libc, the first GCC, with blah, blah, blah. and the whole system is bootstrapped this way. So you you get the source for all the, you know, all the distro. Um, now, if you look at just the runtime dependencies of GNU Hello, of course, it's much simpler. It's just this very simple DAG. You just have uh, Hello depends on libc, which depends on the Linux headers. And the funny thing is that these dependencies, these runtime dependencies, are, are automatically inferred by conservative scanning. Okay. So what Nix does is that when you're done building a package, it will just scan all the files recursively in this package, in this binary, and it will look for, for path under slash nix slash store slash blah blah. And each time it, it finds a path, then it, it will add it to the, to the references of the package, right? So it's like conservative scanning, conservative GCs for, well, you know, conservative GCs for programming languages but applied again to the contents of, of the files. So that's, that's kind of funny. Um, okay, so now, how do you write a package for Nix using Nix? So Nix is actually two things. So it's this storage model, which I just presented, um, well, way of, pack, of managing packages, and it's also language to describe build processes on how you combine packages. So this language looks, looks like this, so it's a functional language. You would define functions with formal parameters. You would call function to actually perform the build. And you can specify dependencies. So for instance, if you want hello to depend on get, on get text, you would just add this line. And, and the builder itself is actually written in bash. So you can, you can interleave bash snippets in the middle of your Nix stuff, okay? Because the, at the end, the build script itself, which executes in the ch root, uh, is just a bash script. So you actually have two languages interleaved. Um, and well, okay. So if, if you want to compose packages, then you you actually call this function, which I presented before, and you can combine things. I'm not going into the details of the language here. So, oh yeah, this is. If you look at at the GPL, it says something about the corresponding source. So uh, the, this is a definition of, of corresponding source in the GPL. Um, so the source code for an object is all the source code needed to generate the object and, and more. But if you think of a normal distro, uh, you don't necessarily have all the, all the stuff to actually build the distro in its current state because distros like Debian are often built incrementally. So like you build packages and then you reuse pre-built binaries uh, that came from somewhere to build new bi binaries and you don't necessarily have the complete specification of how to bootstrap the distro. 
Whereas with Nix, you can, you're actually sure that, well, Nix provides all the tools needed to, to actually get the corresponding source. So you know how to build the, the whole disk tour from scratch. So that's, that's pretty cool, I think. So that, that's, yeah, that's the idea of functional software deployment. So, so just to summarize, so Nix provides immutable software installation. And builds and installations have no side effect on the system. It just creates a new directory and that's it. Uh, so basically building software is just like calling a build function roughly. And you can think of the Nix store as just a cache of the, of the results of these build functions. Uh, yeah, you have garbage collection, so that's what we that's why we call it functional because it's it's like functional languages. It's the very same set of ideas, right? Any questions? Yeah, not. How do you do with security updates to libraries? Like yeah. the security bug in curl 0.7.21.8. Yes. I want to update it point 0.9, so the security bug is fixed. Now the problem is it's a basic library, suppose it was libc. So we have to rebuild a terabyte of dependencies, which will take uh, exactly. next year, right, to get the security update working in my system. How do I do that? Uh, so the short answer is we don't. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I mean, yeah, basically you're right. So when you when you need a security update, like in Libc, you need to rebuild everything to take advantage of it. So so it's a trade-off. Uh, basically, on I mean, between how much work it is to rebuild the whole thing, so basically there's a build farm which does it for us, but still you need to download to re-download all the binaries when you do it. So we tend to not do it very often, but if there's even if they're not affected, you need to re-download, right? I mean, the point yeah. is a security fix. So in the in the library versioning that I would get this this build tool, I can specify you know minor change, EPI yeah. compatible backwards, forwards, or sidewards. Yeah, right, but no, yeah. You, you just tell me, you know, it's a Debian downloading a 5K diff. Yes. You say, well, download this 5 terabyte update. Well, so it uses binary diffs too, so it's not necessarily so much, but still you have to download quite a bit of, of binary. So, yeah, that's, that's not convenient for this kind of thing. Right. Other questions, or should I continue? Okay, so now we, we're getting to the real thing, which is going from Nix, which I presented just before, to Gix, which is a, a nice thing. So what's the point of Gix? So basically, the idea was to, to keep Nix's build and deployment model. So that, that's something which I find interesting, which I'd like to keep. But, you know, it's a different language. So I mentioned the Nix language, so it's basically a domain-specific language, which is very ad hoc and which was written specifically for this purpose. So, you know, you cannot combine it easily with other pieces of software. It's a very specific language and people have to learn it, etc. And, and ideally, so my goal would be to add more GNU people to the mix because unfortunately NixOS is kind of a separate community and there are few or no GNU hackers using it besides me. Okay, so so the idea is to use guide scheme, of course, as a language to compose packages and build packages. So why? Because it works, of course, because it's GNU. And when you're using an actual language implementation as opposed to writing a new language implementation from scratch, like the Nix language, you get quite a number of benefits. So first, for instance, if you use GAL, you get a compiler and virtual machine, which is reasonably efficient and getting better over time. You get Unicode support, you get get text support, you get lots of libraries for many things. So that's going to be pretty handy in your build recipes to actually make use of these things. Um, so Scheme itself supports embedded domain-specific languages via macros. So in Scheme you can define hygienic macros, and so you can basically define new languages which are embedded in Scheme itself, but are more concise and more adapted to, to the specific domain you're interested in which is writing packages. So how many of you are familiar with Scheme? Just Scheme or some other Lisp? Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, and the nice thing is, since it's a Lisp, you know, uh, data and code has basically the same form, so it can be used both for composition and build scripts. 
So you know, when I mentioned the next language, I said you can write so the the basic package composition is written in the next language, but the build script itself is a bash script. Okay, so you're basically interleaving two different languages, whereas here you can use scheme on both sides. So both to, to describe how packages should be composed together and how they should be built, right? So that's pretty nice. So let's see what it's like. So this is how you would define a, a package with Gix. So it's like, I mean, if you're familiar with XML, it's like XML with parentheses. So that's, it must be great. Um, so you would basically provide all the same kind of info. So how your package is called, which version it is, how to get the source code, and what is the expected SHA-256 sum of, of this source table. And then you would specify the build system, configure options, and stuff like that. Um, so here you, you basically specify the dependencies, the explicit dependencies of your build process. So like here I need, I need GNU work, so I just, I just use GOK, you know. And it's just a normal scheme variable reference. So, yeah, you know, it's, it's, there's no magic here. You just somewhere there's a variable defined which is called GOK, and this variable points to a package, to the GNU work package, right? So you can, if you want to build a different variant, you can just say use this as a GOG or build me a different GNU GNUOK and that's just normal scheme code. Um, so when you're saying GNU build system here, it just means that your UX, you, this package has a normal GNU build process with configure, make, make, install. And it also means that it depends typically on GCC, core utils, bash, etc. And that's it. Now, for, for a more complex example, so, so actually I try to get, you know, to, to try packages which, with kind of weird setups where you actually need to patch things or, or something like that to see if it could be done, you know, easily in Scheme. And for instance, in some cases, you know that this version of GNU Oak has a couple of test failures on Sigwin. So in the distribution itself, you still want to have GNU Oak on Sigwin, for instance. So you would say, on Sigwin, I don't want to run this test, the test suit itself, so I can just check here if I'm building on Sigwin, and if I'm building on Sigwin, I can just disable the test, right? And, and for instance, uh, for GNU Oak, running the test suite in parallel doesn't work, so I would just disable it. So you can pass flags depending on which system you're building for, okay? Uh, yeah. Uh, now for some, something a bit more tricky, like if you need to, so this is, okay, this is the basis for, for a package, but now if you want to apply a patch because there is something wrong, you can just add another input here saying, I want this patch as an input, and there you would say, I want to actually apply this patch. So you just, you just pass a patches option and it will apply the patch before building the package. And if you want to, to do sed like stuff, like if you want to patch a file with sed for some reason, so you can basically add a, an additional phase to the build process, saying like, for instance here, just after configure, I want an additional phase, which is this piece of code. And what this piece of code does is doing, you know, patching this file, dinl.c, in a way like, pretty much like you would do with sed. So you specify a regexp, and you say, instead of whatever matches this regexp, I want to insert this line, and you're done. So it's pretty much like sed-es slash blah, blah, blah. Um, okay. Now, so suppose you're done describing a package build like this. So you want to build it, you can do it from Scheme, of course. So you could, you could, you would basically use all these Gix modules, and then you would open a connection to the Nix daemon. So the Nix daemon basically performs builds in a ch root and everything on your behalf. So it's a separate process. Um, okay, so we have our GNU hello package, and it's here, it's, it's re it really is a package. And now if we want to build it, we would first call package derivation, uh, which returns uh, a path in .drv. 
So this is a particular file. It's not the build yet, it's just a do the .drv file is basically a promise of a build. So then you need to instantiate it and this will actually start the build process. And to do that you would call the build derivations procedure which will then instruct the Nix daemon to actually start the build process. And the Nix daemon may decide that there's a pre-built binary available for this, so it doesn't need to actually build it. Okay, so it can either build it or download a pre-built binary if it's available. And then you're done, you get, you get the store path of your package that's built. And you can do it from the command line too, so there's a gix build command which allows you to say I want to build this package and it will just you know do the right thing. Okay so under the hood so what I showed before is a high level interface where you define a package in a very abstract way okay but under the hood you, there's a lower level well there are two lower level layers actually so one is uh, is this build expression to derivation procedure so you would just provide a build script here. Oh, so first you connect to the build daemon, right? And then you provide a build script. So that's why there's a quote here, because actually it's code that is going to be evaluated in the build process itself, which is a separate process. Okay. And uh, so this is scheme code, and this is what we want our build to do. So we want to create a directory, and in that directory to create a file with hello geeks. And well, then we call this function, which will compute the derivation, so this, this .drv file for this particular build script, and eventually we can actually build the derivation and we get, we get our result. Okay. But the real lower level thing, just in case you're interested, is this derivation uh, primitive, where you would just provide you know, a build script here, and arguments uh, and an environment variable. So this this primitive is not bound to guide. Okay, you could you could write build script in in Bash or anything else actually. So this is the lowest level primitive. Okay, so what's the status of all this? So so there's pretty good API and language support to to build packages and to compose them. And it's expressive enough to handle read cases like where you need to patch things a la said or stuff like that. Um, and so there's even a mini Geekspace distro, uh, but uh, it's basically cheating. Like, like it's not entirely bootstrapped in itself. There are only like 10 packages or something. So it's bootstrapped via an XPKG. Since both systems are interoperable, it's possible to, to say, okay, I'm not specifying how to build GCC, I will just use GCC as it's built with Nix PKG. Okay. Uh, so a tentative roadmap. Uh, so there are a number of features missing, like for instance there is no user environment builder. So you know this simlink forest, you need a way to actually build it. So Nix PKG has it, uh, Geeks doesn't have it yet. And there are command line tools which are handy, like uh, I presented Nixamp at the beginning, which is what users use to actually install packages. So there's no equivalent for gigs, so there would need to be one. And the distro would need to be bootstrapped in itself, so that would be fun. Um, so I don't know if you've heard of Hydra, so it's this continuous integration system which is based on Nix. And it's pretty convenient. So when using Nix, there's basically a build farm at, at Delft in in, um, in Holland, which builds all these packages for us. So that's where NixOS users get pre-built binaries from. So it's called Hydra. And if we had support for Geeks in Hydra, then we could also build Geeks packages with Hydra. So we would have would be able to use a build farm to build packages for us. Okay, and one last thing, so the distro doesn't support system-wide configuration, so where you would configure all the system services, etc. So that's one thing that needs to be added. Oh, it, no, the distro has no name actually, so that, that's why, so a name needs to be found and of course you can help build the distro and find a name. <laughs> yeah. 
So, okay, so there was recently discussion about building a GNU distro, so it's, it's I mean, some people don't consider it to be relevant, but there are also arguments in favor of having a GNU distro as opposed to using other people's distro. So, so this is quite of a separate topic, but not completely, as you can guess. So, why would one need a GNU distro? So the advantage is that we would have a direct connection between GNU users and developers, which means bugs would flow directly from users to actual GNU hackers, as opposed to having intermediaries. And again, same for releases. When new, new, uh, GNU developers know that their release is ready for mainstream conception, they could just add it to the distro right away, as opposed to having to wait for the distro maintainer to just pick the new distro, which sometimes happens very, very late, because they don't have a direct interest in in using the new version, right. Um, I guess it could improve integration and cooperation among GNU hackers too. Uh, so first, GNU hackers know how to package their software best. So they know which options are worth enabling, which options may not be relevant for most people, so they can do it directly. And if there was a GNU distro, I mean, like for instance, the Recutis maintainer could go ahead and, and say, okay, I want such and such options by default for my Recutis install. So, yeah, that's that's a good thing. Um, yeah, also something which which happens frequently is that, for instance, you update MPC and it turns out to break. I don't know uh, GCC. So then you could have direct communication between the MPC guys and the GCC guys saying, okay, in the distro we have this problem, uh, the new version of MPC has causes this particular problem with GCC, so how do we fix this in integration bug? So it could be more direct than, you know, having, for instance, Debian just notice the problem and solve it for itself without actually, you know, sharing the results, or less directly. Um, so, of course, the benefit of a GNU distro is that it would use, follow the free software distro guidelines. And it's also good for branding. So, it sounds like marketing, but that's, that's probably important. Like, if you talk to most people using GNU Linux, they typically say, I use Linux or I use Debian or whatever other distro name. So, the distro brand happens to be more visible than, than what's underlying it. So, Probably it would be good for GNU to have this, because we're not very good at marketing, I think. Uh, so why should it be Geekspace, in my opinion? So, so basically, Nix's model is, is superior, I think, to other models, because it, it provides all these features like rollback and uh, transactional upgrades and all this stuff, which is basically not available in other distros and unlikely to be available anytime soon, because it's difficult to do it with a conventional imperative model. And so Nix provides traceable source to binary mapping. So as I said before, the whole distro is bootstrapped. So you can tell exactly how each bit of the distro was built and how its own build tools were built. So that's, that's a unique feature, I think, which is very nice from a free software viewpoint. Um, so Geeks is extensible and it's internationalized because we're using guys, so we can use get text support. For instance, package description are internationalized and it, it all comes for free. So that's cool. Um, yeah, we could imagine Guile to become the official packaging language of the GNU project, right? Okay, so summary. So lots of parentheses and read pass. So you know, typically when I present scheme to people, sometimes at the end, all they remember is that there are lots of parentheses. And when I present Nix to people, sometimes at the end, all they remember is that there are those weird paths with hashes, you know. So my hope is that, yeah, you will remember something else. That's not the important point, I mean. So the important point is, Nix and Geeks provide a number of nice features which are not available elsewhere, like per user and unprivileged installation, transactional upgrades and rollback. And with Geeks, with Geeks you get the full power of Guile to actually compose uh, packages and to build them. And there are a number of foundations for this, which is purely functional package management, traceable package source and dependency, and a completely bootstrap distro. So this is the important point, more important than parentheses and weird path, in my opinion. And that's it.
Any questions? <laughs> yes. Well, Neil? So would you imagine that a prison maintainer might create a package and provide, say, six different versions with a couple of different configuration options? Because you support it. And then would packages that depend on this package have to explicitly declare which uh, options they require? Um, well, I, I typically for most packages I would expect there would be only one variant of the package. But the thing is, the system makes it very easy for users to customize their installations. So suppose you're not, you don't agree with what Jose chose for, for the build options of Recruities, then it's easy to derive a new package and say just set this field, this configure flex field for instance, to a different set of options. And then you get to, to use your own version of Recruities without actually having to modify the distro itself. So I would expect like, that that's what happens for an XPKG, I would expect like you would have a default version in the distro itself which is basically suitable for most people and then it's actually easy to modify, I mean to, to build a variant for yourself if you really need it. And if many people need it then of course you can add it to the distribution as well. Yeah. So you would, like for instance, instead of having just a gok variable, you would have a gok with something variable and the gok with some other thing variable. So you just refer to the right variable which contains the variant that you want. And you get to use uh, the variant that you actually want. So that's the idea. And it couldn't possibly cause a conflict? Well, no. So if you have packages and one package depends on version A and the other package depends on version B. Oh yeah, I see what you mean. Well, it depends. If these are libraries, like if you're trying to compose libraries which themselves depend on different versions of Libc, for instance, yeah, it's likely to be problematic. But in, in other cases, it could work. Yeah. Oh, think John? Um, yeah, my um, immediate reaction is, is that uh, um, I would expect that you would have such a distribution <coughs> that um, typically consume quite an obscene amount of disk space. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, so I'm, I'm kind of sort of skeptical about how usable it would be for the, the average user without having, having to buy a lot more hardware. Mm. So, well, the short answer is that it's really not a concern in practice. I mean, I've been using it for, for a number of years and it's, it I never had, you know, disk space problems. And when you do, you just run the garbage collector and it, it removes a number of things. And yeah, so disk space is also cheap nowadays. So, I mean, I don't know, I have... Yeah, so I have a hard disk which I wouldn't be able to, to fill entirely myself. <laughs> anyway, so, I mean, unless... I mean, if, if, if um, installed packages are immutable... Yes. Once you've installed them, it's installed. Uh, well, it's installed until it's no longer referenced. So again, if like if you have installed an old version of GCC and none of the users of the machine are using them, you can just you can just you know run the garbage collector and it will get collected and removed. Mm -hmm. So that it's usually. You can't roll back to that. Then you cannot roll back to that, right? Yeah. So uh, when you have all these you know, user environment generations, at some point you can decide, okay, this generation from last year, I can safely get rid of it. And so eventually when you run the GC, it will, all, the, all its references will be removed. So right. that, that's so how... Right. Is only as far as the garbage collector ran. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, reinstall the previous version? You mean? Yes. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, if it's. It could potentially be rebuilt, but you would have it in exactly the same state as it was before. Yes, you, w so you would. So if it's still in the distro, the exact same version, you would get the exact same state if you rebuild it. Yeah. Or if it's still on disk, it's the same. Yeah. You could have eternal distros. I mean, you're not forced to ever remove a packet from a distro in this model. From the distro itself, you mean? Yes. 
Yeah, right. You, you can uh, maybe not the binary packet, but the source description is very short from what I see. Yeah. If so, you have 10,000 versions of GCC, it doesn't really matter. No. So, I mean, I mean yeah. The user would have to rebuild the package on its own machine. Yeah, right. So typically for, for packages like GCC, you would keep different versions because different packages tend to have different requirements. But for like RQT, I, I would expect you keep just the latest version in the distro itself because that's what people want in general. And, and how would you imagine um, um, such a distro would be, well, distributed? We, we would have to have a, a server hosting it somewhere. Yeah, so... That itself would require a colossal amount of, or could potentially require a colossal amount of disk space. And there, and there would be no... It's only a cache, right? Yeah. It's, it's all functional, so you can throw away the cache any time and rebuild it required and get the exact same output. Exactly, yeah. Yes, but um, even, even the sources would... The source is always there. We knew it was never thrown away all the fireballs, right? And there's also no compression in space. It's not a big uh, amount of space. But but GNU, um, many GNU, not many, some GNU packages uh, depend on things which are not themselves GNU packages. Oh yeah, but I mean, if if uh, anyway, if if we were to build a GNU distro it would have to, to integrate non-GNU packages because otherwise, I mean, we so, so <laughs> like the kernel. We would have to host um, the, all the versions of, at least the source versions of all those um, oh, no. dependencies. Well, or else we no, I mean, you can... So basically, in the, in the in the recipe, which is how you, where you described how to build the package, you specified the tarball is at this URL. And so it doesn't have to be a GNU URL, you know. It's it should have a list of URLs. Um, Either this or this. Or yeah, right. This, this yeah, so, yeah. So that's in the works. Yeah. Um, yeah, then you just have to hope that that, that uh, never breaks that, that URL. That yeah, so, yeah, so if it's a third party URL, that's not something we, we can actually control, but, yeah. you know, most, um, I, I would guess most important packages have stable URLs. And yeah, yeah, yes, um, but you see also because of your, your version, we have to depend on this particular version. Uh, some some non-GNU projects don't keep their old versions lying around. Yeah, but in practice, few of them actually remove old versions. I mean, in NixOS, which is a real-world distro, uh, it is really not a problem for, for the vast majority of packages. Yeah, so what, what would be important is actually infrastructure to, we would need to have a build farm to, to pre-build packages because we don't want to build everything from source on, on our machines. It wouldn't be, yeah. you know, usable. So for NixOS, there's a pretty big build farm in TU Delft, which is very handy because it pre-builds the, the, like most of the distro for you. So we would need something similar to have pre-built binaries available, I guess. You had a question? Some of the features uh, for the use of, uh, for example, uh, Gentoo, the Gentoo distribution, in particular the fact that every user uh, configures it as he likes. And one of the problems of Gentoo is uh, the, uh, that the package maintainer can, can hardly uh, provide support for a bug that uh, a Gentoo user uh, that's simply because he cannot reproduce. Here it is, it is better because you have uh, the notion of uh, the environment of a, of a build, mm. but nevertheless to make... Uh, uh, what would it take uh, to, um, for a bug reporter to transmit uh, to the maintainer of a package uh, instructions how he could get the same... Get the very same environment, uh, supposed to, uh, assuming he has the same uh, hardware. Uh, mm -hmm. What would it take? Can you can you make 
can you make a file which contains um, the description of an environment that can be transmitted and, and uh, installed at a different machine? Yeah, so it's, it would take, I mean, as a bug reporter, you would have to report the build recipe of your package. So if you didn't modify it, you can just say, I use this revision of the distro. And so the developer can actually check out this revision and build the package as it was in this revision, and you get the exact same binary. Yeah, but if, 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 he has, if he has modified uh, yeah. five or ten of his packages, so let's say yeah. he has made a small modification to GCC and a small modification to GDC, and, and yeah. he has a particular error, and uh, yeah. he wants me to debug that. What, what does he need to do? So if he's modified some of the packages in the distro, he would basically need to send you a diff compared to the distro, for instance, or to send you the whole recipes or something. But as long as you have the, the package recipes, you can rebuild the, the exact same thing, right? So if you modify directly the distro source files, you just you know, ask, ask for a diff, and then you build it yourself on your machine, and you should get the exact same result. If it's deterministic, that is. It would be handy to have a command which uh, uh, does this thing like uh, package entire environment and uh, on the other side install entire environment and uh, I could. Yeah, so I mean, one of the things you could do is just to transfer the actual binary from from the, the bug reporter to the developer's yeah, machine. But that's we will not install binary from anyone. Yeah. <laughs> Alternative proposal, which I think is better. Uh, whenever you install a package, you can also save somewhere some immutable metadata, which say that the, the recipe which has been used at build time. Yeah. Even if the user changes later, the original is saved. So that you can implement a, a, a command such as a save complete, a dump complete recipe. Yeah, right. And you can transmit that, mm -hmm. which is small and source. Right, yeah, yeah. like having a bi-directional association. Yeah. Yeah, right. But then it's tricky because the build recipe is written in Guile and Guile itself ev evolves, so you know, yeah. it's not. So we would need to store a, a lower level representation of the recipe, like the dot .drv files maybe, I, I don't know. I can show you an solution app, so you will not like it. Yeah. How about configuration files? Are there inputs, or would you directly specify things in the guy recipe, like so what the port for your Apache server or something? Uh, so the way it's done in XOS is that you have this, you know, whole system configuration file, where you would have, you would say Apache dot HTTP port equals to eighty eighty, for instance. Um, and then it will generate, when you type mixOS rebuild, it will generate an apache.conf file or something um, and tell the Apache process to actually use this configuration file. That's, that's how it works. <laughs> so yeah, uh, this, you mean a GNU distribution versus a distribution of GNU, right? That's <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, so so there was a lengthy thread on GNU system discuss the mailing list, and I think some people said the distribution itself should not be called GNU because of the confusion, so it should be called GNU something. So yeah, probably to avoid the confusion, you would have to to have a different name because GNU is supposed to be the operating system, not the distro. So. <laughs> Sorry. You use GNU, and then you use other flavors of GNU. GNU is the official one. Yeah, but that's well, yeah, but yeah, but then it causes confusion because GNU is supposed to be synonymous for GNU slash herd. So if you use GNU to you know. <laughs> Maybe to name the distribution. Gnu curve is just because we are running now with Gnu slash the kernel. If was not, it was not because that. If we have a not put uh, say okay, have, yeah. we will not use it. We will call the distribution Gnu. Yeah. So I think we should just use a different article instead of using an indeterminate article. Should say use a Gnu distribution instead of the Gnu distribution. 
like yeah. the but, but a GNU distribution now means a distribution of GNU herd. So that, that's a bit. Uh, okay, add a new version of this. Who yeah. cares which kernel it is? Let's call it the GNU professional. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and get fees oh, yeah. for it. <laughs> Professional edition. <Yeah. laughs> Sounds cool. In different distributions of the same operating system, hmm. tailored to different needs and blah 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 blah. Yeah. No, <laughs> yeah. So it wouldn't sell well. Professional edition sounds better. <laughs> There's a, set, a, a Zulu word for the migration of GNUs. You know, they migrate from one place to another. Uh, have to look it up. <laughs> <laughs> what, what are you thinking uh, about the use of VLTS and a snapshot in for, the, for keeping versions also for the configuration files? Which ZFS? You said? Uh, um, BDFS. It's, it's ah, but better, so better, better FS, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So you can get an app start and say, okay, yeah. Uh, I the etc. When I install the new version of the SSH demo, mm. I make an app start and I go yeah. back to the snapshot shot and I one. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. That's that's what some people argue. So that's not the approach that Nix has taken. And I actually think, I'm, I'm not sure it would work well because, you know, the file system level is not the same level as the packaging level. So you would be basically mixing concerns and I would expect that in some cases you wouldn't be able to express what you actually want. Like, I want the previous generation of my environment, but the file system itself doesn't know about user environments and packages, so... Yeah. I don't know. And how would you do garbage collection and things like that? Yeah. Okay, are we done? Cool. Okay, thanks a little bit again. So, so we had uh, a few talks this afternoon. Uh, Mike is coming to talk about Gamer, and Luca is talking about Epsilon. And <laughs> okay, everyone, so Mike is going to talk to us today about starting a new production society in Europe. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me. Uh, it's an honor to uh, give this presentation here. Uh, I don't want to make a big speech about uh, this whole project. It's more like a more elaborate lightning talk, I guess, and then we can maybe have some discussion about the topic. And it's probably something which is very different from the topics you have discussed so far and are discussing here because it's not really about software in its center, but uh, about building a new collecting society for Creative Commons licensed uh, works. Um, the first uh, minutes I will uh, roughly walk through uh, why I am here right now, what has happened in the past, in the past few years, and why I'm doing this. Uh, and then I'm uh, going to talk about a, lit a little bit about the C3S project, what we want to build and what we need to achieve this goal. Um, and then uh, some notes about the software that we need. Of course, we want to do uh, build the whole project on free software. That's why I'm here right now. Um, and that's about it. So um, I want to start in 1995 when I founded uh, or co-founded a band on my own. So I began to really make music and uh, being serious about that. Um, in 1997, I began to study psychology uh, at, at the University of Marburg, and uh, that's the point I got in contact with uh, the free software movement for the first time, and I've stuck with that ever since. Um, then in 1998, we released our first album uh, on a, a cassette and also on the internet for free and uh, I began to think about uh, this whole free license thing. You know, um, back then uh, the GNU general public license was widely used for software projects but there was no real standard in free licensing for uh, other works 
back then. Creative Commons uh, wasn't there yet, uh, so we really had to improvise a little bit how to uh, make clear that our music uh, wants to be shared under the same uh, principles that uh, free software is. Then in 2001, the Creative Commons uh, organization started and released uh, their first set of licenses. In uh, 2003, I became a member of the uh, Marburg Student uh, Representatives, student organizations, ASTA, uh, and founded the uh, Referat für Technik und Open Source Politik. Uh, please don't throw any things uh, at me for using the term open source and not free software. That was actually uh, on purpose because we wanted the students to see that open sources in various ways are an important topic for uh, the culture. So this was not really branded on technical issues only, but we wanted to... Uh, later we would probably have used the term free culture, but we didn't think of it then. Uh, this gave me the opportunity to, in 2005, and now it's get, it gets interesting, uh, to start a project called uh, Open Music Contest, which uh, was intended to promote Creative Commons licenses among uh, musicians and people who like music. So we wanted to uh, make a public statement that uh, please think about free licensing of your works and people who want to uh, enjoy music please think about the uh, you are given by the authors of this music if you want to listen to it um, and we gained really um, big media attention for that uh, over several years we did this for uh, four years in a row and then uh, switched over to the C3S project um, we released uh, 11,000 of uh, samplers like these. Some of those uh, were double CDs with uh, really um, elaborate artwork and so on. And we gave them away for free. I have them here. If, um, I don't know if, if, they, if they are enough, I can uh, bring some more. But you can uh, look at them. Uh, so we, we really produced real CDs uh, and we did that because we wanted to bring the Creative Commons uh, topic into the real world so people could touch it so that it would not only be something that is on the internet but that is, is happening for real. Um, and we did some concerts, that was the reward of uh, the contest. Um, so we invited some bands to play in front of huge audiences. So we, we had uh, every year a big um, a big building with three different stages and several bands on it and uh, booked um, known headliners to get the people coming there because if, if you do concerts with only unknown bands usually nobody will attend so uh, we used um, known headliners uh, to bring in the crowds and we had uh, for these concerts we had about 5,000 uh, visitors each year and we had a lot of support for different organizations. That's not uh, all of them, but uh, all I could get on this slide. And in 2010, my band released uh, another EP, uh, this time on a 10-inch uh, gatefold purple vinyl issue, and again uh, under a Creative Commons license. But perhaps um, more importantly, in 2010, we started the Cultural Commons Collecting Society project. Back then, we called it Creative Commons Collecting Society, but we changed the name to make clear that, uh, firstly, we are not involved with the Creative uh, to fix things up, and that we do not only want to support one kind of license, but uh, we want to uh, maybe support all kinds of free licenses that are available in the long term not in, in the beginning. So what is this project about? Um, this is the list of collecting societies that are in existence in Germany today. So you can see there's a lot of them, but only one of them, the GEMA, maybe also known abroad, uh, is the only one that is representing uh, musical rights. And for several years there's been a lot of discussion about the way GEMA uh, does this and um, as a fact for each of these CD productions 
uh, we had to give all the music that is there to GEMA to check if it's uh, GEMA licensed music and only after GEMA says, okay, you are okay to produce these CDs, a CD factory in Germany would begin the production. And that can be a, a real issue if you are short on time, for instance. We also received a bill in one year uh, for two tracks on one of these CDs because GEMA uh, said or, or was under the impression that this music was by GEMA musicians, but in fact it wasn't. And it was really, really hard um, to get this thing off the table. So we founded a small team. This, again, this is not all of the people that are involved, but maybe the most active. Um, to say, okay, uh, firstly, GEMA doesn't want to support Creative Commons licenses at all. They have repeatedly stated this. And we think this is something that cannot hold for long. And secondly, uh, GEMA is a monopoly uh, at the moment, so you don't have a choice. You can either um, become a GEMA member, then you can never use Creative Commons licensing again, because um, the GEMA only licenses all of your repertoire, or you can't be a GEMA member. Um, and I forgot how I started this sentence, but it will uh, make sense in the end, I hope. So what uh, this project um, is going to be, or what we want it to be, is an, a Europe-wide collecting society. So we don't want to concentrate this only on Germany, but we think, uh, why not make this all over Europe? We are concentrating on Europe because the copyright laws and uh, the rules for collecting societies uh, in Europe are rather the same, um, but there are differences if you go, uh, for instance, to the American market where uh, copyright is, uh, follows a, a different philosophy than uh, copyright in Europe. We are starting with music for obvious reasons, um, but if you think it through, this concept could work for other uh, kinds of works as well, for pictures, for texts, even for software in, in theory. Um, but we'll try this uh, with music um, to start it, and if it works, we can think about uh, expansion. Of course, we want to support CC uh, licenses. Um, the difference is, as, as I said before, that uh, Creative Commons licensing is a work-based licensing. So you can, for each work that you have done, you can decide under which kind of a license you want to give this to the public. Uh, in opposition to that, uh, the GEMA um, concept is a person-based concept. If you become a GEMA, every of, of your works, each and every of your works, will be represented by GEMA. So that, in, in, in consequence, even if you perform your own songs from the per perspective of GEMA, you are someone who needs a license for that, which we think is a bit absurd. What we also want to uh, accomplish is democratic participation. This sounds like a no-brainer, but actually, if you look at uh, the way decisions are made uh, inside GEMA, it's only 5% of the members uh, who have uh, voting rights, and that's the 5% who earn uh, at least 30,000 euro a year uh, through GEMA. No, not in one year, uh, in five years. So you must... Uh, uh, in, on the average uh, gain 6,000 euros a year um, through GEMA and then you b uh, get voting rights because only then you become a full member of GEMA. And if you don't, then, well, you get your money but you don't have anything uh, to say inside the structure. So 95% of the GEMA members uh, are like passive members and we want to change that. We want uh, that every member has the right to decide uh, how this whole enterprise works. Uh, we want to raise transparency, which is also a problem for the tariffs that uh, GEMA released um, because most of the members don't even understand the bills that they get at the end of the year. And of course we want to build the whole thing on free software and open standards. And this is probably um, something of, of a race condition. 
because um, at the moment we are gaining momentum. More and more people are interested in what we are doing and we, are, we, we get a, a growing group of followers of, of this project and more and more people want to help us doing this. But you know, the percentage of people who are aware of, the, of what it means, which way you go software-wise, has a real implications in the long run, how free you are in your decisions to make, this percentage is really slow, uh, really low. So um, it, it's really, really, really um, important that we don't wait too long until we have something that really works for this project, because otherwise more and more people will, will say, well, there's this company, they do something similar, what we need, let's just buy that. And then you have a vendor lock-in, perhaps. Uh, what we need to, to really get going is we need a suitable legal form to really work as a collecting society all over Europe. Um, we think we found one, that is the European Cooperative, uh, called SCE in short. It's a rather new legal form, so um, it's also interesting to uh, find lawyers who really know what you need to do to found something like this. Um, we need some starting capital, of course. Only to found an SCE, you need 30,000 euro. Um, we, also, we already have an investor who uh, says, okay, we will give you this kind of money, this amount of money. Um, and then, well, we need some millions uh, to get the whole project started over the first years because uh, obviously uh, once this thing is founded it will not make enough money uh, to really keep this thing uh, alive. So we need some more money for the first years until uh, we have contacts to all the important business partners, partners and so on. Then uh, another legal um, legal demand is that you need a permission from the German Patent Office. Um, the Patent Office does the uh, governmental supervision of collecting societies in Germany and uh, you can start working as a collecting society but uh, at some point you need the permission to do so otherwise, uh, well, you're really screwed. And um, the thing that they care most about is um, the economic viability of the whole thing. So it's not about um, how you do things, it's just it needs to pay out, especially for the artist in the end. That's the most important thing. And therefore, we need uh, artists and repertoire. We need stuff to sell, to say it that way. Um, this is especially important for the business plan because when you apply for um, the, uh, at, at the um, patent office you need to show them, okay, we have these artists who want to be represented by us and they will make uh, this amount of money in a year and this will pay out in this and that way. And of course we need the free software to keep this thing really going uh, at, at many places. I will uh, talk about that in a minute. So, what software do we need? We don't really know <laughs> in detail. Um, we have some areas that we certainly know that we need stuff uh, that works. Of course, we need several databases. Um, we need systems for music uh, identification. Uh, you must have a reliable way of telling, I mean even if you put some ID tags in a m m media file, you need a way to find out if this file is really the file that the um, ID tags tell you it is. So this is, um, otherwise you can have, I don't know, viruses that uh, simply overwrite uh, the ID tags uh, in, in files so that one certain artist gets paid a lot of the time. Yes? Do you need to connect the specific performance of a work? Or, or, or you just, or for example, if the artist A sings the same song as the artist B, do they match according to your system or not? If you want to recognize this kind of matching, I think it is beyond the state of the art. There's no physical. Um, yeah. Are you talking about performance or the authorship? Because um, say that author A is singing the song already, already reg uh, registered by the uh, artist, now artist called B. I don't think we can automatically recognize this fact. 
um, you don't have to um, automatically find out uh, who the original author is. Um, because um, every work that uh, will be represented needs to be registered. That's, that's the idea. So we will only represent what, what is registered as a find of, kind of file, in a way. So all we need is to find out if this file is really what it says it is. Okay. Like, like a, a hash sum or something. Yeah. But it, it, it's, it's, um, then it's very easy to, to break. If you change one bit, the, the, the checksum changes. But the performance is essentially the same. Yeah, I, I really believe that all of the things that we need is not impossible. That, that it's really um, a, a lot of software is already there um, for um, the database thing, for instance. Uh, maybe some of you know the Music Brains uh, database. Um, there's a lot of information already there. They, they cover about 11 million titles of music in their database. And this database is uh, under a public domain license, so you can just work with it. And um, for instance, Last.fm is using the Music Brains ID that is in the Music Brains database to identify their music titles internally in their database as well. So it would make sense to uh, build uh, this that is, that is already there. But we uh, just didn't have the time yet to work this all out in detail and to really find out, okay, which, which kinds of projects and so on are already available in uh, free software. Yeah, we need uh, something to handle playlists. This is, that, is, uh, that is important um, to really accomplish something like a one-to-one -one payout, so that um, if an artist gets played and someone pays for this, this money should really go to this artist. This is not uh, something that is really fully available um, if you are an artist at the GEMA, because they receive a lot of money for we play 24 hours of music, but we won't tell you which music this is. And they have some contracts that allow this. So they, uh, at the end they get a lot of money, but they don't know which artists were really played. So they look in their statistics, which artists get usually played, and then they divide this money um, by this key. They don't know who they're playing, and they know what's usually played. <laughs> they have some numbers uh, yeah. because um, some large radio stations must uh, give them playlists while all the small radio stations don't need to. And since we all know that small radio stations do not necessarily play the same kind of music that the large radio stations do, uh, we consider this system rather unfair. So we think there's, there's uh, today, um, with uh, modern uh, technology, there's ways to make this work very easily and transparently and almost automatically for those uh, radio stations, so we don't see uh, any reason why we shouldn't do this. My understanding is that in France, if you, if you play music in public, like even if you play music right here with, with all of us in the audience, then you would have to tell the collecting society that you're actually playing this music. Even if we're just like 25 people. In France? Yeah. Yeah, that, so. that would be uh, much better. <laughs> but that doesn't mean the collecting society has to tell anyone else. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, we also want to make uh, online payment possible. Um, and we want to we want to implement something like uh, the flatter principle as well. So it will also be uh, able to um, become a member of this collecting society even if you don't exclude the right to use uh, your works commercially. So that you can maybe register works under uh, Creative Commons attribution license where you only need to state the name. But uh, it should be possible, we think, to maybe make a plugin for the Amarok music player or VLC or whatever, um, so that you can uh, donate some some money in in a way to something that you like. Just that should be so really easy. Once you have a central database that really is capable of identifying uh, the the artists and uh, songs that that you want to pay for, 
um, in a transparent and uh, in, in a way that uh, your privacy isn't harmed. Of course, the whole thing needs to scale because we think if people find out that it really works uh, and we are working Europe-wide, this will become rather large uh, rather soon. Um, and we need to think about which kinds of open standards and uh, APIs we want to um, have to, so that maybe other people uh, or enterprises can uh, transparently